Yeah. No. Well, maybe, maybe he couldn't make it. Okay. Good morning, everybody. How did you like the change in the weather? <laughs> was it, um, I'm thinking, last week was the last day of this. Oh, he's here in person. Oh. Stuart, hello. We just got started. Okay. Do you want to sit over there next to Regina or over there? Either way. Hi, Stuart. Hello. <laughs> Good. How are you today? I'm oh, very cool. Yes. Yeah. Well, anyway, I was just starting and I was saying how um, I think it was just a week ago, those absolutely last gorgeous days where it was what 60 <laughs> degrees and sunny. I got my lawn mowing done Thursday and Friday. And then <laughs> oh look what has happened. That no. uh this is a kid's book that extreme weather that Melanie just found. And I had mentioned, I think in my some newspaper article maybe, that I was doing this weather series and that we had some wonderful books here at the library. Unfortunately, I took two of the three out. Sorry about that, guys, but they'll be back soon. But this is a great book, The Clouds, or The Book of Clouds. Mm -hmm. And for those of you that don't like a lot of reading and just lots of pictures, let's see here. It's mostly pictures. Okay. So I've just brought this one back. So this is available. And we will be doing clouds and precipitation in maybe a month. Let's see. All right. Need to get started. Now, Stuart, if you need me to speak louder, just wait. Okay. Okay? <laughs> All right. Thank you for saying that. Great. I don't know sign language, <laughs> except I wave my hands around a lot. All right. I wanted to start, as I usually did when I was a, an official teacher somewhere, with a brief review, because some people, well, you forget from two weeks what went on or you're new to the class. And so I'm just gonna spend a few minutes going over the basics of what we covered the first time. And that is the old question, <laughs> weather versus climate. Because often people get them mixed up. How are we doing? Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Um, the weather is when you get up in the morning, you look out your window and something's happening. It's raining, it's snowing, whatever. It's local, it's in your backyard and it's probably only for that day or maybe two days, three days. That's the weather, it's a local event. Climate on the other hand, covers a very large area. For us, I called it the Great, Great Lakes region. Um, usually in a large region like that, we know what the summer temperatures are going to be, sort of. We know when the snow is coming or whatever. So that's our climate. And that's based on an average of 30 years of keeping records. And you average it all together. Sounds like statistics. Um, and then we sort of get a feel for what the climate is like in our large region. Going back to the weather, it all takes place in the lower part of our atmosphere called the tropopause. No, troposphere. Got to remind me only when I get it wrong. Troposphere. And we live on the bottom of an ocean of air. We're walking around here on the sidewalks in Alfred. But on top of us, for five, six, seven, eight miles, is air. And it's pressing down on us. So in a sense, like the fish, the flounders that live in the bottom of the sea, the ocean, we are creatures that live on the bottom of an ocean of air. And we're new, usually not aware of that. Mm -hmm. However, um, do I want to get right there yet? No, not yet. I'm going to hold off on my seventh grade experiment for a few minutes and go on with my review. Then we looked at what's weather. And it's basically precipitation, whether it's rain or snow or whatever. It's the humidity, 
how muggy does it feel? How much air, water vapor is in the air? And air pressure, which I did not get to last time because I talked too long about these other parts of the, of the presentation. And we will get to that in a minute. And finally, we talked about the idea that we have air masses, huge volumes of air, maybe 500 or 1,000 miles across, maybe three, four, five, 10,000 feet high, but it all has basically the same temperature, the same humidity, and the same air pressure. So it acts as a unit. And we then looked at two basic types of air masses that affect us in Western New York because of where they came from, where were they born, and therefore what characteristics do they have. And the one was a continental polar air mass, which comes down from Alberta, Saskatchewan, or Montana, off to the Northwest, overland, no nearby oceans, and it's relatively dry, cool in the summer, cold in the winter. Um, and it's, we call it a high um, air pressure system because of the density of the cold, dry air. The other comes from the Gulf of Mexico. And it's, um, oh wait, did I mention that's called a continental polar? Mm -hmm. Okay. The other one is the um, maritime tropical. And that's from the Gulf of Mexico main, mainly. And it, it's warm or hot and it's humid and muggy. And it comes up, usually funnels up the Mississippi and Ohio River to get here. Okay. And that's what we don't like in the summertime. And that's what we never used to have in the summertime years ago, that hot, muggy weather in the summer. But we do now. And so it's, that's where it's coming from. All righty, that was the review of the basics that we covered last time. Now to move on so we can get done with the end of the first time and the rest of the second time, I want to talk about air pressure. That was the third thing. Precipitation, humidity, and air pressure. So we're living at the bottom of the ocean of air, which means if you measured the weight of that air. Now, you don't, air doesn't weigh anything, does it? I don't feel it sitting on me. But in truth, for every square inch, square inch is not very big, 14.7 pounds is pressing down on us. And the only reason we don't get squished is that the air inside our body, in our blood, in our ears, equalizes that. It's pushing back at the same rate. However, one of the best experiments, Stuart, I did, I think when I was teaching seventh and eighth grade science, you take a gallon can, an empty metal gallon can, you put about a tablespoon or two of water in it, sit it on top of the Bunsen burner, turn on the Bunsen burner and boil the water away. It takes about five minutes. Don't burn your hand. Steal the top of a can and set it on the desk and go on lecturing, whatever the lecture is about. And the can sits there. Okay. Did you ever see that, Stuart? I don't think so. You told me about it. I mentioned it on the phone. Regina, you want to describe the people who are listening couldn't see you probably what, what's happening. Um, what, what does the can do? I, the can just impl implodes. Is that a it crumples? Yes. Yeah, and, and then itself. Yep. And it's because of the there's less pressure inside than outside, so it just I assume. Yeah. It just goes in. That yes. In other words, by uh, boiling off the little bit of water, creating the steam, and it escaped. It created a partial vacuum. Then when you sealed it. That reminded me, back in the 1800s, some scientists, either in England or France, I don't remember which, did the same experiment. But he had a big metal hemisphere, I don't know, maybe 10 feet in diameter. And then it screwed together. He did the same thing as we did with the can. And then he had teams of horses to try and pull it apart. Couldn't do it. They couldn't pull it apart. 
because of, once again, the outside air pressure that normally we're not aware of. So um, that's the crushed can. Then I remembered another thing on the news years ago. I'm going to guess 30, give or take 10. <laughs> there was this, I think he was a young man or a middle-aged man, and he decided, and I think he was somewhere in the Midwest. In other words, when I remember things, I don't always remember the details. Like, was it Kansas? Was it Ohio? Was he young? Was he? But it was a guy. And he got his lawn chair and some beer and a whole bunch of helium balloons. And his friends started tying on the helium balloons to his launch. You remember this? You're laughing. I don't. You know what's going to happen? <laughs> what's going to happen, Melanie? He's going to start floating. He's going to start floating upwards, right? Um, and he did. Once again, I think three, four, five thousand feet. Oh, wow. wow. Um, and just like the hot air balloons have to, when they want to descend, they have to let some of the the hot air out. He had to start pricking balloons so he could descend because those balloons would have exploded eventually. I no, don't know how hot. Maybe he had to go to 8,000 to start popping. Mm -hmm. Because uh, of the air pressure? Because the air pressure outside was dropping and it was the same inside. Oh, okay. The balloons were beginning to expand. And then you would crash to the ground like Icarus. So he managed his experiment, but the FAA got really pissed at him because he got high enough to get into the air traffic lanes. <laughs> anyway, I don't know what happened to him. I think he got fined. But anyway, do not do this. Anybody that's listening, especially you kids, do not do this. Okay. Crushed cans and the man in the chair. <laughs> All right. Today, we are not going into the details of the science. Remember I said science is basically almost any science or all science based on math. And that's quantitative approach to understanding life. But many of us non-scientists think in terms of quality, qualitative words. And I don't want to get into the weeds too often on the math part and drive everybody crazy. Um, so I'll just mention what it is without really explaining why. Okay. When you have a mass of air, picture a balloon with the air inside and then take away the balloon, you've still got this volume of air. If it begins to rise, a couple of things happen. What will happen to its temperature? Cooler. Cooler. That's cooler. What happens to the air pressure? Less. It drops. And then oddly enough, and once again, you have to accept it on faith, the humidity um that's the second thing goes up if nothing else changes and the humidity goes up because the density gets smaller right yeah i think so you're right yeah. yep 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 now mm -hmm. i can't remember regina did we talk about dew point last time in I'm passing sure. i'm not sure all righty you've all experienced you gin and tonic drinkers in the summertime you decide it's time in the afternoon for your gin and tonic and so you go to the fridge and you get your ice cubes and um, the tonic. I don't know. Do you keep the gin? I don't think you have to keep the gin in the fridge, but the tonic is in the fridge. And you pour it all in the glass. And all of a sudden, the outside of the glass gets wet. Mm -hmm. Where'd that come from? I didn't spray water on my glass. All righty. Relative humidity was, we did talk about that the amount of vapor in the air compared to how much could be there at that temperature and pressure. So the higher the percentage, the more muggy we feel. But once you reach 100%, normally you can't go higher than that. That's it. That's as much as it can hold, no more. Then if it continues, to cool down, it comes back out as water drops mm -hmm. if it's above 32, or if it's below 32, you have frost, ice crystals. Mm -hmm. So the dew point is the temperature at which 
saturation in the air is reached and then it comes back as liquid or ice. All righty. Can I ask yeah. a question about yeah, absolutely. humidity? Yeah, oh yeah. Um, <laughs> you may not be able to answer. Talk about humidity in the summertime, like when it's hot, mm -hmm. as opposed to the winter. Is it because it's colder in the winter? And so we're not, Okay. it's not as humid? That's a good question. That is a good question. Um, but there's two subtle answers, I think. Where do you spend most of your time in the winter? Well, inside. <laughs> inside. And what are you doing to your, the air? When I walked in here, what did I say? It's hot. It's hot. hot air can hold. You know, if you don't add moisture, it gets less humid without oh, going into the math. Because it's expanding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So for two reasons, it's colder. So it's holding less moisture to begin with at a given temperature. Um, and you spend more time indoors where you're heating your house, which is causing humidity to drop okay. and your hair to go crazy and your skin to get dry mm -hmm. and you put i have a wood stove i put the pot of water mm -hmm. starting around now on the wood stove to create more moisture in my house so i mm -hmm. feel comfortable and this just this is why we never get to the end of my lectures <laughs> um if you study evolution and anthropology human homo sapiens evolved in equatorial africa mm -hmm where it's usually quite humid and the temperature fluctuates 68 to 85 roughly that is what we feel even though it's been millions of years of evolution our body remembers that's my theory we evolved in a climate that did not vary much in temperature mm -hmm. what do we set our house at 72 mm -hmm. why is that because once upon a time that was the average temperature we lived in. And also the humidity was probably, I'm guessing, 60, 70, 80, 90 percent. Mm -hmm. So we don't adopt well to dry air. You get bloody noses. Yeah. She was talking about Tucson years ago, the desert. Um, people's hair goes crazy. So anyway, do you have to go? No. Nope. No? Okay. Um, so very quickly, we're not really going into clouds today and precipitation, but just briefly, um, the sun comes up in the morning, warms the ground. By conduction, the ground warms the air that's touching it right above it, first couple of feet. As air is warmed, it expands. All those little molecules going faster. And as it expands, it becomes buoyant and it rises and cools and it reaches a certain height above depending on how humid it is to begin with and what the temperature is to begin with and the dew point is reached maybe a thousand feet up maybe or if it's right at the ground it's fog anyway the clouds form at that level when the dew point is reached so the drier the air the higher up the base of the cloud will be all righty uh 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 Okay, clouds. We'll talk about clouds and all how they form and all the complications later, some other time. Now, I was thinking this morning, if you have a solid, a book, a piece of wood, a chunk of ice, it sits there. It doesn't Normally, it doesn't sh change shape. But if you have a liquid or a gas, and they're called fluids, a liquid or a gas, they just fill up whatever the container is. If I poured a pile of water on your table, it would run off on the floor. If the floor was slanted, it would go out the door. Eventually, it'd wind up in the ocean since we're 2,000 feet above sea level, and that's where it's all going. Um, but you can contain it in a cup or whatever. But a gas, also a fluid, has no boundaries. You set it free from the balloon or the tire of your car, and it just expands until it equalizes out with whatever the air pressure around it is. So if you're driving your car and you go over a nail, the high pressure air in your inner tube, if they still have inner tubes and tires, 
and out it goes into the atmosphere and you get a flat tire because it wants to equalize itself. The high can't stay there when there's a low over here. Mm -hmm. It just wants to spread out and make it all equal. Now, let me think. So we tend to have, and, and most people have TV. That's the one bad thing about the weather report on the radio. They don't give the visuals. They don't what? Give the visuals. They tell you if it's going to rain and what the temperature is going to be. And maybe, maybe how much the wind is going to be and where it's coming from. But you don't have like on TV, you have all the, you can see the front coming in. You can see the hurricane swirling around. So um, we label those air masses we talked about as highs and lows, meaning the pressure in the whole system that's a high is greater than the pressure in the low. And highs tend to be cold and dry air and lows tend to be warmer and humid air. And then what happens, and once again, we won't go into the mathematical details, um, just have to accept this. Like when you were a kid and you said, Mommy, why is the sky blue? And your mother said, It's God's favorite color and He made it blue. So just accept it. <clears throat> if you have a, a, a huge air mass and it's a high, cold and dry, the Air is going to flow out of that system in a clockwise, if you're looking down on it, direction, like the clock goes around from midnight to six. Alrighty. But if it's a low, then everything's flowing into the center of the low where the pressure is the lowest. That's, and it goes counterclockwise. That's how, what hurricanes are. Yes. And and we'll we might even spend a half a session later in the winter on hurricanes. But you're right. And um, ta-da. Counterclockwise. Oh, and that's only for the Northern Hemisphere. We're going to forget the Southern half of the globe because not that many people live there and everything's backwards and upside down. So we're not going to consider that. All righty? All righty. Zero them. Back with them. I once gave a course on maps, the art of map making, and I have a whole series of wonderful ways of mapping the world. And one was put out by Australia. And here is the map of the world with Australia at the center and everything else on the periphery. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Now we need our first picture. It was this one, right? Uh, that one. Yes. And oh, by the way, folks, uh, Rima had a change in schedule. She can't be with us anymore on Fridays. And so Melanie, the head of the library, has, has got snatched away from her desk. And so far on this cold, cold day, no one's come into the library. So hopefully, because if she leaves, I don't know how to find the next picture. So this is Melanie. If you can see her, the head of the library. Uh, and she's going to be our, our our technical sidekick for the <laughs> rest of the some. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll try. Term. She'll try. No, she did a good job. Okay, this is the beginning of the official part two. Here, where are we? Almost all of the energy that we on the Earth have, ninety eight, ninety nine percent of it comes from the good old sun, ninety three million miles away out there. And here is a a, a sketch. What is that? A drawing? A picture? of the earth. Why don't you turn that a minute so they can see it? Now, what I was going to do, and you can do this at home, folks. You got a flashlight. A flashlight? A flashlight. And here's the earth's surface. What is wrong with this? It's flat. And I'm sorry, guys, unlike 2% of Americans, I do not believe the earth is flat but we're going to pretend uh, because it's easier to see. And then in your imagination, you can just switch things around. But if you hold a flashlight straight up and down, 90 degrees over the table, all the light and the heat from the flashlight, sunlight, strikes in a nice sharp circle. But if you bend your flashlight 
that circle extends into an, um, an ellipse, an oval, and it's paler. It's not as bright because the same amount of energy is spread over a greater distance. That's what's happening to the sunlight, our source of energy and heat and heat and light energy hitting the earth. Now, I did want to point out, we had an astronomy class here a couple of years ago. We had a great time with that. Um, let's say our earth was not tilt, tilted the axis at 23 and a half degrees, give or take a little. Say it was sitting straight upright, spinning around, going around the sun. Um, then the way the sun struck the earth's surface would be the same mm. at that every place all year long. Constant. Constant. No seasons. Um, no long summer nights for us in the mm. north. And um, right, in the summer. Okay. Um, but the poor earth would be much hotter at the equator mm. and it would stay there and the poles would really, really, really be cold if that were the case. So the fact that we are a lucky planet tipped at a certain angle, <laughs> I won't go to Uranus, which is tipped all the way sideways and they have a very weird seasons. We won't talk about that. Um, but the fact is because we're tilted, it creates seasons. And it creates wind patterns, which we'll talk about in a minute. And it mixes up the heat from the equator to the chill at the poles and makes the mm. whole planet more livable mm. for life as we know it. All righty. Can we find um, the next? Oh, and by the way, oops, I'm sorry. Can you pop back to that? Oh, to yeah, the... I just wanted to point out. Now, these lines that you see, the equator, the two tropics, and then up at the top and the bottom are the Arctic and Antarctic circles. Those are, in a sense, real lines. Now, if you got up in a satellite and looked down, you wouldn't see a yellow line around the Earth that it was painted. But they are lines created by the sun shining at a 90 degree angle mm -hmm. at certain times of the year. So in a sense, they're real astronomical lines, and they have a real effect on our weather. Okay. Um, and we and Alfred live at about 41 degrees north, so not quite halfway between 30 and 60 north. Okay, so now we can go to the Hadley cells. Yes. Okay. We talked about, hmm, that's too complicated. Oh, I see. That's not that clear, is it? Can you make it larger? Oh, beautiful oh. snowflakes. We'll save those for when we talk about snow. Can you make that bigger? Nope. No. All right, guys, you're going to have, let's go back then to oh, the wait. other. Oh, there we go. Okay. Well, this is an example of somebody that got too much time to do their art project <laughs> and got carried away and put in too much detail. So let's try and get rid of some, uh, in your mind's eye, get rid of some of the detail. We're going to start at the equator where most sun throughout most of the year strikes fairly directly. And so it's the hottest part of our earth. What happens, has anybody here ever lived? I lived in Panama once, so I sort of remember even though I was little. Anybody else live in the tropics? Traveled there a little bit. Okay. What was the weather like? What time of the year did you go? In, well, Where were you? What country? In March, I went to Brazil and I was right like three degrees below the equator. Oh, that's okay. March for them would be um, September for us. Right. Okay. Yeah. What was the weather like? It was very hot. Mm -hmm. It was hotter than... I thought it would be um because it was March and it was hard to comprehend mm -hmm. that it was backwards. Yeah, backwards is the right mm -hmm. word. Did it rain every afternoon? No, it didn't when we were there, but I think okay. it does rain quite a bit. We were in the rainforest and the Amazon rainforest. Okay. Maybe you were in the drier of the 
seasons possible. But usually what happens, and when you want to simplify things, <laughs> we're teaching basic ideas. Um, normally what happens if you live in the tropics near the equator mm. is that as the sun rises and heats up and the, all that water in the jungle and the leaves um, is always very humid. And usually what happens by the middle of the afternoon, you have a downpour mm -hmm. almost every day, which is why you have the rainforest in that part of the world. Um, let's see now, I don't get, I'm wondering. So the sun is heating the ground. It's heating up that column of air, thermals, they rise, they reach the dew point, they make clouds. If it continues, then they start to rain. But that whole, um, think of convection. If you've ever boiled a pot of water on your stove, bubble, 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 and it starts to boil. And if you drop some red dye right in the middle, that red dye begins to circulate in a pattern. The heat rises, it floats to the side, and then it cools and sinks. And that's called a convection current. And it happens in water and in air. <laughs> and a man named Hadley, I forget when, hundred or so years ago. A uh, name who? Hadley. He, he came up with this concept that at the equator, the air rises and then begins to flow north and south and then begins to fall. And when air falls, drops back down, it um, dries out and warms up. And so um, at 30 degrees north, we're going to forget about the southern hemisphere, you have a hot, dry band around the world. And 100, 200, 300 years ago, when the Europeans started traveling through the oceans of the world, exploring, you told me what it was called, that band around 30 degrees the north. Doldrums. The doldrums, <laughs> which once again, I don't know the origin of that word, but we have come to take it to mean Lethargic, sluggish, I'm in the doldrums, I'm not getting anywhere. Wasn't it also called the horse latitudes? The horse latitudes, mm -hmm. because if you got stuck in the doldrums in a big sail ship and you had 90 sailors, all who had to drink water, but you had some horses with you for when you got where you were, who's going to get thrown overboard first? The horses. Now, whether that was true or one of those mm -hmm. myths, I don't know, but it's been come known as the horse latitudes. Hmm. Um, then as you move further north, there's another cycle that starts a little around 40 to 60. We live under that cycle, 40 degrees north to 60 degrees north up in Canada. Um, that's the mid latitudes. Hmm. We'll get back to that in a minute. And then above 60, you get into the third cycle, which is the polar regions um the old joke in alfred was if you don't like the weather wait a day it'll be different tomorrow and the reason for that is that in the mid range 40 50 degrees we're between those warm tropical moist airs and the cold polar airs and that's where the mixing happens and whenever you mix air masses of different temperatures and humidity you get wind. Okay. It's not usually windy in the tropics, except maybe as part of thunderstorms. Mm -hmm. um, but you up here, we're in the westerlies. Most of our wind and the air masses come from the west. So as I said, I think last week, if you have a radio and at night, some of the AM stations from further away come in after dark. So if you want to know what's going to happen tomorrow, tune in. WHAM, I think, is Louisville, Kentucky. Or I forget the call numbers for um, Detroit. Um, because at 30 miles an hour on the average, weather fronts move from west to east. So if, if Chicago is 600 miles away, then in 20 hours, whatever is happening in Chicago probably will be happening here. All righty. Um, let's then, can we find the one that shows the, um, the 
the biomes mm -hmm. where the forests are in the deserts. We had a hard time finding this one. Um, I was just thinking after we went through this, too much detail again. If you have a big lawn, a big lawn, it's hardly ever a mono lawn, lawn, perfect everywhere the same. There's always the low spot that's going to be soggy and damp and different things might grow there than just your grass. And then there's the, the grass under your sugar maple tree, which is always going to be drier and not grow as high. So in the world, depending on general climates, which are based on those cells we just looked at, we are going to find, let's see here. Let's start at the top. Let's see, at the very top, which by the way, most people don't realize, the Arctic is a desert. Mm -hmm. Because if you counted the inches of precipitation, if you converted the snow to rain, it would be less than 10 inches a year. Mm -hmm. Now we find that hard to believe because it seems like mm -hmm. there's snow there all the time, but that's just because it doesn't melt. So at the top and the bottom of the world, we have these polar regions and Antarctica that are tundra and ice caps. That dark green band, there we go, thank you, through Canada and then Finland and all through Northern um, Russia, Siberia, that is the boreal forest. Say again. Boreal forest. Spruce trees, pine trees, evergreens. And that, by the way, is the largest forest in the world, if you figure all the different types. Okay, we're going to skip all the, now, then in the middle part, once again, there's a lot of variety. The pale yellow, our great, uh, pale yellow, there we go. Our great plains, way over to the right, the steppes of Eurasia, down in Australia, a shortland gr uh, grass already. And then the orange, pale orange, our southwest and Mexico deserts, the Sahara biggest in Arabia and some of Australia, which is once again, 30 below, I mean, 30 south. So the deserts all line up pretty much around 30 north and 30 south, most of them. Um, the deciduous forests that we know, the mixed forests are in around 40 degrees. And then we have our uh, tegia is it, it's called mm -hmm. the boreal forest and the and so so i always i love maps and the fact that the earth tilted the way it is creates seasons and the the way the sun strikes various latitudes equator on up to the arctic creates cl uh, climates which when you compare it with the soil that's there and the weather day to day gives you deserts or rainforest, you know. Desert or what? Rainforest, you know, or something else. But it's um, it's really neat to look at it on a map and see how certain areas of the world match up because of where they are, north or south of the equator. All right. Um, let's see. Alrighty. What other pictures do we have? We have um, Katrina, Katrina and the Gulf Stream. And the Gulf Stream. What do I want to do first? Um, let's do the Gulf Stream first. Now, I think most people have heard of the Gulf Stream. Um. Let's back up my general review at the beginning. And I said, liquids and gases are fluid and they flow. And with air, it depends on the temperature of the air and the humidity of the air and the air pressure as to whether it goes up or sideways or whatever clockwise. But that in, in the ocean, we also have density. And the colder the water, the denser it is and will tend to sink. And the saltier 
the water, the denser it is and will sink. And just as in the atmosphere, yes, Aberdeen <laughs> has a question. Hey, look, uh, yeah, salt water. I thought, did I get that backwards? I don't know. Because it, you know, you float so much easier in salt water than, right? but that's different. Okay. And Sorry. once again, what you're floating in is a shallow um, layer. And since it's denser, no, I guess it would then be. that allows you to float more easily. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, in the atmosphere, those Hadley cells circulate the air due to temperature and humidity and air pressure. The same thing is going on in the ocean. And you got to remember, guys, we are land creatures, but this is not a land planet. This is the water planet. It's what, 72% ocean. That's a, <laughs> I have a picture once of a map when I was talking about perception in my art classes of a view of the globe from the Pacific. There's Hawaii way over here just an edge north america and over here an edge of what what australia or, it's all water there's mm -hmm. hardly any land in that view from space or the artist's conception so if we keep that in mind um the ocean as well as the air in circulating is also affecting the weather and our climates and I was just going to give two examples. One is for us on the West Coast, no, on the East Coast of America, the Gulf Stream. And when, let's say from England or France, sailors Repeat back, that, please. okay, when the sailors in the, say, 16, 1700s began trading back and forth between England, France, and the new U.S. colonies in those days. Um, it didn't take the sailors long to figure out, hmm, if I take the northern route when I'm going to America, is that right? And when I'm going back to Europe, the southern route, it's much quicker. And to jump ahead to our own times, my daughter just <laughs> attempted to fly out of Buffalo in the blizzard this morning um, back to the West Coast. If you fly from, can, uh, say, Los Angeles to New York, I think the trip from west to east is an hour shorter than when you're going back. Well, that, for us, is because of the jet stream. And, and the fact that, well, not the jet stream so much as the fact that the winds tend to come out of the west. So the plane flying west is flying into headwinds. And the plane plane flying east is going with the wind it's like s swimming upstream or downstream mm -hmm. you're going to get downstream a lot faster than you're going to get upstream because you're going against the current all right so back in the day when we knew less but the sailors figured out there's something going on here in this north atlantic ocean there must be some current a river in the ocean and we now call it the gulf stream and it is like a river in the Atlantic Ocean that starts down near Bahamas, Cuba, flows north for a little bit and then shifts off to the northeast and heads up between England and Iceland. And in doing that, it brings the warmth of the tropics up towards the Arctic, mixing the water, just like the air is mixed. Um, but for water, it's the temperature and the salinity that count. And I remember reading um, an article I thought was really good. If you were a really good swimmer. Really good swimmer? Swimmer. And you started in Florida. I forget if it was 50 miles out, you reached the edge of the Gulf Stream. And if you were swimming, you would instantly know it. Mm -hmm. It'd be like stepping from the land into the water. Because the temperature would go up. And I think it would be more salty. Mm. Got to, uh, look, check that up, guys. If, with your... if, if you were in a airplane or mm -hmm. could look down, is there any visual um, difference? I would think so, but I don't know. That's a good question. Because the pla the plankton would probably change. Vikings? Plank 
Captain, those little tiny microscopic microscopic oh. sea creatures or the algae or mm -hmm. whatever. I think probably that you would be able to visually tell the difference, but I'm not sure. But definitely the temperature changes rather abruptly and the salinity. And that is why, folks, um, I read a lot of English mysteries and I read a lot on gardening. And part of our tradition on gardening in America is England's gardening. And so, uh, and we have, by the way, and I've complained about this, sometimes the library gets these wonderful pictorial uh, gardening books. And I look to see where they're printed and it's in England. So their authors are really talking about England and their environment for these plants. And so I finally, one day I, I got actually found a book on the kitty stand all about the habitats in England and the plants that grew there. Just like, like in New York state, there'd be the Appalachian mountains, the Mohawk Valley, the Long Island, we we're all very different. I was fascinated. So I got this book and I started reading it and it suddenly dawned on me that England as a whole is like Virginia and North Carolina in their weather zones six seven and eight which is why they can grow all those gorgeous rhododendrons because it's not that cold i have a okay a, a incident more than an incident but uh i was in scotland and uh a sabbatical mm -hmm. and uh on the coast of scotland certain place and palm trees grow. yes the west coast of scotland you have palm trees but if you looked at that map of uh, like we can look on this map and you use your pointer melanie so take northern england there england yeah there go straight across because that's the latitude straight straight across, <laughs> come on, straight across. Come on. Come on. where are we when we hit america way north we're in labrador <clears throat> Now, what do you think of when you think of Labrador? Cold. Snow, ice, mm -hmm. cold, zone three, maybe zone two. <laughs> What's going on that England, that is at the same latitude as Labrador, has the weather and climate as point way down there to um, North the Carolinas? The Gulf Stream is mm -hmm. warming the climate. Yes. The Gulf Stream, this huge body of water that's warm is taking that heat north so that England. The British Isles. The British Isles, but not only them, nor uh, Germany and France for ways inland before mm -hmm. the effect is lost. Aren't uh, London and Montreal approximately the uh, uh, I think it's further north, London. I think you're right. Yeah. yeah. I was trying to think of a city that I could. Yeah. With. Well, in Labrador, there are not many cities. Um, yeah. What was the city when 9-11 when, when and all the planes were grounded mm -hmm. and several had to land there in Labrador? Mm -hmm. Oh, I know the name and I forgot. I'm a student. Give me three choices and I'll pick the right answer, but I can't remember it on my own. Well, okay. <laughs> Halifax, but that's not in Labrador. No, no. And that's, yeah, that's different. So most, most of Europe is considerably north of say new york city um yes so. we should get I another think, map we should I get another I'm, map can you I'm, find another map of I think Paris is north in Montreal. yeah because i think italy when i went to my daughter's wedding in italy that was the same latitude as us mm -hmm. and italy is quite a bit mm -hmm. south well, okay. i i can't while we're recording okay. she can't well, okay the computer isn't totally magic. It moves through everything you want it to do. Um, at the end of this four-month session, I want to spend one or two units on, in general, climate change and what's happening to the weather. Um, and just briefly, one of the concerns the scientists have, and they have proof that this has happened several times in the past million years. Every now and again, the Gulf Stream collapses. And all of a sudden, that warm warm water going north towards Europe, northern Europe, disappears. And when that happens, and some scientists think it might happen, 
within 100 or 200 years if we keep warming the climate. Um, and it's because of the amount of salt and fresh water um, with the, say, Greenland melt melting and diluting the salty mm -hmm. water. And then it upsets the current. And then all of a sudden it collapses. And we have proof that it has done that several times over the last several million years. But if that were to happen, I'm sorry, London, you will not be like Labrador. But that's not a laughing matter. All righty. Um, I want to talk about one other um, current. And I couldn't find the name. So, guys, you're going to have to go do your homework and look it up. But anybody that has gone to San Francisco are aware of two things. You don't go swimming in the ocean in San Francisco or up in Sonoma because it's too cold. The water is just too cold. Um, and the fog. Mm. And they are all due to this same sort of thing. Um, coming down out of Alaska and Northern British Columbia, down through Oregon and Washington and into California, Washington first, and then Oregon, and then California, we had this cold current. Mm. And so it chills, and it's quite close to the coast. Mm. So it chills the water, and it's no fun to swim there. It's really too cold, um, even in August or September. Um, and the other thing is, any kind of moist air drifts out over the cold and once again, precipitates out as fog, mm. an advection fog, they call it. And so that's one of the reasons, once again, we have all that fog, especially in the northern part. All righty. Is there a name for that? For it? I think it's Humboldt, but I'm not. That's what pops it's into my Humboldt. head. Say but, again. Humboldt. But that. H. He, yes. He was a famous German um, explorer back in the 1800s, scientists. No. But that might be the one down in Peru that's partly responsible for their fisheries and for El Nino, et cetera. But once again, that's if somebody had their computer here or their smartphone, no, she didn't bring it. Um, you could find that out in about two minutes if you knew how to do it. All righty. Um, let me think here. Oh, guess what? What time is it? Nine twelve twenty-four. You have six minutes. Six minutes. Perfect. I actually got done on time. Next time we're gonna do clouds. So guys can take the book out. It's a beautiful picture book. Lots of you know, the first chapter tells a little bit about the science, okay? But then it's mostly just examples mm -hmm. of once again. <laughs> You can simplify it. There's three kind of clouds. And then you can get into the weeds, as they say, and you subdivide. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Um, so we're going to talk about cloud families, um, how they form, uh, what kind of precipitation they create. Um, we complain about pollution. If there were no aerosols, we call them tiny, 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 tiny little particles, whether it be dust or salt, if you live near the ocean, or the fumes of the gas from the cars, if the air was totally pure, it would never rain. It would never snow. Because raindrops and snowflakes need some little particle, a seed, a nucleus, to latch on to and begin to grow. Hmm. And let me think. Those of you that like old movies, it was Burt Lancaster and I think Catherine Hepburn, I'm guessing a black and white from the 50s. And they lived on, she lived with her family on a ranch and they were in the midst of a drought. And Burt Lancaster, I don't know, he was a drifter or something. And he shows up on the farm and decides he can make rain. It's a great old movie. <laughs> but anyway, all about faith and whatever. The mixing of faith and science. But we did, we started after the Second World War, seeding the clouds. 
Yeah. With silver iodide, was it? I don't. I it sounds right. So I think with silver iodide, and they're still working on experiments like that. And of course, a lot of advance in science comes out of the military. And of course, we could be generous and good-hearted and say, well, the military would like to learn how to seed clouds and make it rain so we can feed our people. But the flip side of that coin is you can take the rain away from your enemy and starve them to death. Don't want to give Putin any ideas. <laughs> but anyway, um, what else? We're going to then, um, we'll, there's all sorts of precipitation from fog to drizzles to snowflakes to blizzards. And maybe, yeah, I think we will. We'll talk about lake effect snow, which is what's happening to Buffalo today. So I don't know if you folks who don't pay attention to the news, Buffalo starting last night, running till Sunday. The governor has shut down the thruway. If you're planning to go anywhere on the thruway from Rochester to Erie, PA, forget it because it's closed down. State of emergency. Yep. Yeah. Um, all of they just uh, all of Southern Erie County is also roads closed, can't drive. Um, they're expecting anywhere from two to four feet of snow, mm -hmm. which certainly does not match the seven feet they got in 2014. Right. I was flying out four days after that when I was thinking, I'm going to be able to get out of the airport. <laughs> so we in Western New York, and we're lucky because Alfred is really at the end of that lake effect look at if you look out we we only got an inch or two of snow yesterday mm -hmm. and we're probably only get to get maybe an inch more over the next two days but buffalo is getting slammed why you know so we'll talk about that if you're interested as to why um any questions we actually got done on time back to the gulf stream oh yes gulf stream after it goes by scotland let's say mm -hmm. uh, what does it keep on going? Okay, I want to, I have a vague idea, and I did read all the details once, but here's what basically happens. Go, let's go back to the rainforest and the warm, hot air rising up, cooling, and then settling back down, and then the deserts are there. Well, with the Gulf Stream, it's the temperature and the uh, salinity that determines wh what's happening. So as it goes further and further north, it gets colder and colder and it shrinks a bit. Cold water is denser than and not as expansive as cold water, which is denser. And therefore it gets saltier and the saltier it gets, the heavier it gets. Saltier? Saltier. The salinity increases as it gets colder and therefore it begins to sink. And you can find maps at home on your computer, which show the main streams in the ocean. The Gulf Stream is just one. And they all circulate. And I'm thinking I read a drop of water here takes about 70 years to go all the way around the system. Hmm. And it's amazing, you know, there, there's the Gulf Stream, there's stuff in the Indian Ocean, there's stuff down around in Antarctica, mm -hmm. and it's really amazing. And it's all hooked together, and it's all connected. And sometimes the results are instantaneous or very rapid, like a hurricane developing fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. Other times it takes 70 years for, to get from one place to another to transfer all that heat. Isn't the... the east coast of uh, England, let's say, mm -hmm. um, where, where the, the, isn't the North Sea uh, shoreline of England quite a lot colder? I believe so, because once again, it's not influenced by the Gulf Stream, which yeah. is yeah. two, three hundred miles away to the west, and the land is in between. Mm -hmm. it's, it's almost, I'm just making this up, it's almost comparable to the fact that it's, it's our east coast is considerably warmer than our west coast, right, right close by. Um, let me think why that would be. If that's I think, true, I think. Well, let's go back to the North Sea. I think I think the North Sea uh, shoreline of of Great Britain, England, I should say, is 
not hospitable to, to, to swimming at all. I would I would think so, because once again, it's not affected by the Gulf Stream. Yeah. Yep. Um, and I would have to think about whether the East Coast is warmer than the West Coast. Did you say, or was that the of our country? U.S. Well, yeah. I was. I was. I was saying. I don't really know this, but I think the East Coast water is considerably warmer than the West Coast. Oh, the water, yes, yes, but I'm not sure about. The, okay. In other words, the climate. If you took okay. wherever, whatever Savannah, Georgia is, um, latitude wise, and you went straight across to wherever. Let me think a minute. Come to mm -hmm. L, come to L.A. about that. Time. I think San Francisco and New York City are on the same latitude. We, we could check that. Um, no, I don't know. I think so. Because I remember when I used to drive. <laughs> Um, sometimes I would take the shortest way, which would drive my son crazy because the shortest way sometimes meant going off on a dirt road for 10 miles. Where are you going? Well, the highway, for some reason, went this way and then back that way. And for some reason, it was this little dirt road that would go straight. I did that in West Virginia once. Did you? Yeah, well, that's, like that. it's easy to do that. Oh, that does remind. Yes, my second husband and I. We were going down. It was, it was right after not. Um, when was the the nuclear disaster down on Three Mile Island, in the late eighties? Yes, and that had just happened, and he was very concerned about that. We had to go to D.C. Well, it's hard to go through Pennsylvania on a straight line to D.C. anyway, but he was determined not to follow Route 15, which would go through Hershey, Pennsylvania, where those um, uh, nuclear power towers were. So we just, he decided we would go straight over the mountain on this, what was a two-lane road? Well, this was in April. And it was a two lane for about two miles. And then it turned to gravel. And then it went to dirt. And then it started doing this hairpin stuff. And then the snow appeared. And we didn't get to the top. And we were in six inches of snow. And I kept saying, we got to turn around. <laughs> the top of this. And then some teenagers in one of those big cars that like to go mudding. They showed up. And they looked at us and said, hey, where are you guys going? Richard said, Washington, D.C. They just looked at us <laughs> and said, well, you're not going to get to there from here. You better turn around. <laughs> so anyway, maps are great. Maps are funny. The weather is the top of the mountain in, in Pennsylvania is different than the two lane road down in the valley all on the same day. Mm -hmm. So anyway, any more questions before we wrap this up? Okay, and who knows if anybody's out there in the clouds? Hello. Right. When when do you 